100,000 dead people. 100,000 in in January. 100,000 dead people in the United States in a month. That's very unfortunate. Yeah, that's, but yeah, I'm sure politically you, are, politically you are a little stable than what you were before, I guess. That's right. <laughs> okay, so it's five o'clock, Thomas, so let's stand up. Okay. <laughs> It's over. Okay. Uh, now, you know, instead of wasting time, I'd like to begin the proceedings. And first of all, I welcome my dear friend, uh, Professor Thomas Pogay. I mean, he, as you know, is a full professor holding a particular chair, Littner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs at Yale University. That's this kind of formal identity which needs to be told to my friends, colleagues here at Bishop Bharati. Besides that, you know, Tom is a very dear friend of mine, and he is a kind of you know person who introduced me to the intricate world of medical science and philosophy. And we had long discussion over dinner in, in, in Hamburg, because he belongs to Hamburg, which I didn't know. But you know he's basically a German, but now settled in the United States and contributing to philosophy and international affairs immensely. And Tom has also got a connection with India because while working on alternative medicines, he visited Kerala pretty often. So now they, this time I request Tom to include 
West Bengal, and especially uh, Shantini Ketan, where my university is located, to come and explore his area of research in this part of the country. And today he will talk about the, the uh, kind of you know, futuristic scenario of the world. And Tom is very imaginative and creative in his thinking. And he's the one who mentioned me again and again that in order to be a good philosopher, one needs to be a good economist and a mathematician. So Tom is a, a very interesting kind of combination of philosophy, mathematics, and economics. And um, Tom, I'm personally, I'm thankful to you because you accepted our invitation and um, uh, we'll be, uh, we are waiting to be enlightened by your very uh, you know, thought-provoking, I, I presenting very thought-provoking ideas and also erudite presentation. And let me tell you about this university. This university is one of the oldest uh, universities in the country because it came into being in 1921, uh, founded by one of the illustrious sons of India, uh, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore, who go, got Nobel Prize in Literature in 1913. And after that, he started this university in 1921 just as an alternative center of pedagogy and learning. And today it has become a huge university, but primarily a residential university. We have got uh, 57 departments and eight faculties and philosophy is quite rich. And um, you must have heard Kalidas Bhattacharya was one of the teachers uh, in this department. Ramu Gandhi taught here for a while. Uh, so philosophy department has a good reputation in Vishwa Bharati, and I'm trying to carry that forward by recruiting people uh, from all over the world. And, and I, I'm sure with your uh, support and blessing to this campus and uh, with your um, willingness to share your knowledge with my colleagues, we'll really be able to reach an exalting height in course of time. So um, this is just one of the so many of your lectures in our campus. And as you said, you, will, uh, you don't mind, you know, uh, lecturing again and again. So that's the kind of privilege which I would like to take as your friend and as also, also a formal institutional head of Vishwa Bharati. Now with these words, again, Tom, thank you very much for having accepted this request. And I'm sure uh, those who listen to you will be terribly benefited you know, by your knowledge and um, uh, since we, are, we will have the convocation tomorrow, we may not have the interaction session tomorrow. So I request the, uh, the participants to carry on the discussion and Tom is willing to carry on so, till he gets tired. So um, that's an opportunity for us to have direct interaction with Tom. And with these words, um, Tom, now the floor is yours. You can begin. Thank you very much for this very generous introduction. And I am sure that I will get tired later than you because I am 10 and a half hours behind you on the clock. So I'm just getting up and just reaching peak energy. So what I want to talk with you about today is what sort of political world we can attain in the 21st century and uh, this will involve also thinking about what the problems with the current political world are and how we might be able to fix these problems and in particular make our world safer, safer from violence and safer also from other problems such as poverty and climate change. So, this is a picture of particular options for the world that you are probably familiar with. This is, uh, these are the terms of the discussion that often is conducted about different ways the world might be. We say that there could be a world of rival actors, basically uh, an anarchic world, a world in which you have a plurality of states competing and conflicting with each other, but without any kind of 
system of rules without an institutional order under which these states exist. The second model would be one where you have states under laws, under international law and various other rules like the WTO, for example, a, a, a system of states that make themselves rules and live under them, but do not have any kind of world government, no legislature, no world executive, no world judiciary. And the third option finally would be something like a world state, where you imagine the world organized much like maybe India or France is organized today as one centralized system with a common mode of government. So obviously these are not discrete options. There are intermediate options. It's more a spectrum maybe than uh, three discrete options, but that's where much of the thinking takes place about international affairs. And I want to enrich this thinking a little bit today by talking about other features of systems, but we'll see how that goes in a moment. So let's start with talking about in institutional order, what that is. An institutional order is involved both in the system of states under law and also in the system of a world state. They have in common that there are shared institutions under which uh, various players, be they states or corporations or individuals exist. Uh, my teacher, John Rawls, referred to such an order as a basic structure. So what's involved here, we have a system of authoritatively formulated public and recognized standing general rules and practices under which conflicting claims among participants are authoritatively and effectively resolved through rule-based and rule-governed procedures without resort to violence or the threat of violence. So this is the kind of picture of a basic structure or institutional order that we are familiar with in states, within states, and that we might also want to institute globally. Now, constituents of such an order are, first of all, the most important, that there be recognized clear laws. We have to know what the rules are, and these rules have to be clear in terms of laying down what individual and collective agents within some jurisdiction are entitled, permitted, forbidden, or required to do. The laws need not be egalitarian or equal. They need not treat everybody equally. There could be different rules for men and women, for people of different castes and so on. But it's important that the rules be clear and widely recognized, that everybody understand what they are. This is, again, by way of explicating the concept of an institutional order. The laws must be consistent so that whatever any one participant is entitled or required to do, no other participant is permitted to prevent her from doing. And these laws must be complete so that persons do not have conduct options whose deontic status is left indeterminate. In addition, you need upstream procedural rules, higher level rules about how the substantive rules can be authoritatively decided upon and also how they can be altered and revised in case that's necessary. And finally, you need downstream rules about how the substantive conduct rules are to be interpreted, adjudicated and enforced. Now, Immanuel Kant, when he thought about international relations, 
uh, he thought within that sort of picture and famously in his work Perpetual Peace, he laid out the two institutional possibilities that I canvassed at the beginning when I showed you the triangle. He writes as follows, for states in their relation to one another, there cannot be any reasonable way out of their lawless condition, which entails only war, except that they, like individual human beings, should give up their savage lawless freedom, adjust themselves to public coercive laws, and thus establish a continuously growing international state, which will ultimately include all the nations of the world. This is a world state, of course, a single world state. But under their idea of the law of nations, they absolutely do not wish to do this. And so they reject in practice what is correct in theory. If all is not to be lost, there can be then, in place of the positive idea of a world republic, only the negative surrogate of an alliance which averts war, endures, spreads, and checks the force of that hostile inclination away from law, although such an alliance is in constant peril of its breaking loose again. So here you see very clearly formulated the two models that we are talking about, the model of a world republic and the model of a federation of states under common laws. Now, what motivated Kant's thinking is a very important piece of uh, theorizing that was prominent in the West for a thousand years. Kant was simply one in a long line of thinkers who all thought the same way. It's a mistaken mode of thinking, but it's interesting to understand it and interesting also to understand in detail why it is mistaken. So what Kant thought and what before him in particular Rousseau and Hobbes thought, also Baudin, also Dante, also Augustine, they thought that, or they were taken by the following argument. They said, if there is to be peace and order within a particular realm of human beings, there must be a complete and effective decision mechanism for the authoritative resolution of all conflicts among the participants. So whenever there's a conflict between two participants, there must be a clear path for the resolution of that conflict. Now, this path, this resolution, cannot be provided by a code, like for example, a holy scripture, a text, the code of Hammurabi, what, whatever. That cannot solve the problem because it is subject to conflicting interpretations. There is an important class of conflicts that cannot be resolved by the code, namely conflicting interpretations of that code. So we need, at least in addition to the code, we need an active authority. This active authority cannot be divided either horizontally or vertically. So you can't have branches of government or federalism between the union government in Delhi and the provinces because that would leave the potential for conflicts over competence. Who is in charge? Is this a matter for the legislature or is this a matter for the executive? Is this a matter for Bangalore or is this a matter for the union government to decide? So these conflicts cannot be resolved if you have several paths that are appropriate for different conflicts. What we need is then 
uh, but let me say first, the authority, the active authority cannot be limited either, so that some, it has a certain amount of authority, but then its authority runs out at a certain point. For example, when there are individual rights that people have. That again, is makes the conflict resolution incomplete because there can be conflicts about the limits of the authority in question. So what peace and order presuppose according to this line of thinking is an undivided, unlimited active authority called the sovereign. The sovereign who is above the laws who is the final judge of positive and natural law, the final arbiter of religious scripture, and the ultimate court of appeal for all conflicts whatsoever. There can be other authorities, but they derive their powers from the sovereign and can be deposed by the sovereign at any time. So I'm thinking of the vice president of being the sovereign of the university, but I will leave that thought hanging. Now, this line of argument, I call it the dogma of absolute sovereignty. It dominated in the West for a thousand years, even though it is really, if you think about it, quite silly. It's not really plausible. First of all, it doesn't work. Even if you have a sovereign, let's say uh, some man who is the monarch and is in charge of everything, like you had in France, for example, in the 17th century, even then there can be conflicts over who the legitimate sovereign is. You know, was this boy born before that boy? Is this boy really the son of the previous sovereign? Has the sovereign gone insane? Uh, is this person the sovereign or the lookalike person who looks very similar? So conflicts can always arise. And the idea that we could have some mechanism that could solve all possible conflicts is ultimately a mirage. And there's a second problem that is that uh, and that is something we know much better now than we did in Kant's time, that there are institutional systems that work very fine without such a last court of appeal. There is no sovereign in modern day India, and nevertheless, India gets along quite well in resolving her conflicts, uh, despite the fact that in some cases, there is no recognized authoritative path of legal resolution. There could be conflicts between the lower house and the upper house, between the executive and the parliament, within, between the judiciary and the parliament. Conflicts for which there isn't really a clear path of resolution. And nevertheless, these conflicts do get resolved, often under strong pressure from public opinion, or from other parts of the constitutional order. And the fact that we are in a way living on thin ice, that we don't have a complete decision-making mechanism isn't really quite as dangerous as Kant and Hobbes and Rousseau and so on assumed it to be. So now let us think about the modus vivendi system. By a modus vivendi, I mean an institutional order that is decentralized, where you have many different, or at least a few different entities living together under one institutional order, a system of the sort that we now have on the global level. Uh, modus vivendi is a decentralized order and the key thing is, and this brings in a whole new element now, is that it is based on prudence. So prudence, by prudence, I mean that you have agents who are interested in their own thriving, in their own flourishing. And when they live in a system like a modus vivendi, a system where they 
are governed by common rules. They try to maximize their power within that system in order to be able maximally to influence the rules and enjoy maximum protection from the rules. So we are talking about a system of many centers of power together upholding a system of rules, an institutional order, if you like, and trying to shape this institutional order to their own advantage in such a way that they themselves enjoy maximum protection. A modus vivendi, which is such a decentralized institutional order, it works because the rules are designed in such a way that each participating player has sufficient prudential reasons to stay on board to comply with the rules. Every one of these agents, large states and small states, they're constantly asking themselves, is it in my interest to continue to participate, to play by the rules? And, or am I better off defecting? And the system survives so long as the rules are designed in such a way that for each player, the answer is positive. Yes, indeed, you are better off complying with the rules than defecting because the rules advantage you to a certain degree that makes it in your best interest to continue to comply. So this is a system that goes back to Thomas Hobbes, but Hobbes, of course, didn't think in detail about the solution because he thought that in a world of prudentially motivated players, we need the Leviathan, we need an absolute sovereign whose power exceeds the power of everyone else by a million so that that single sovereign can keep everybody in awe in his formulation. So he did think about international relations, but only very briefly, but it is nevertheless a Hobbesian model because it is all based on prudence. You have agents, they may have values, moral values, religious values, but they subordinate their moral and religious values to their overriding imperative of power maximization. You see that every day in international relations where states are saying, look, we believe in human rights, we believe in this and that, but we are competing with the Chinese or with the Americans or with the Indians or whatever. And so we cannot afford to be gentle and kind and live up even to our own values because we are caught in a power struggle where for the sake of the survival of ourselves and our values, we must downplay these values and try to maximize our own present and especially future power. So what any party's prudential reasons are depends on the interests of the party and in particular on this party's power, which is determined by the threat potential, what can that party threaten, and by that party's vulnerabilities, what can that party be threatened with, what are that party's vulnerabilities. Now, modus vivendi is quite an interesting and miraculous thing. It can last through, yeah. It can last through changes in the interests and power of different participants by virtue of the fact that it can be adjusted, it can be renegotiated. In particular, when parties become more powerful, for example, as India is rising and is becoming more and more powerful in the world relative to France and Germany and Britain, let's say, 
India can request more favorable terms. It can say, I want a seat in the Security Council. I want more votes at the World Bank or the IMF. And other parties that are weakening will prudently accede to that request because they want a stronger India to remain committed to compliance. So the rules are adjusted to reflect the new distribution of power and that makes the system stable. The system is stable because the rules are adjusted in such a way that parties, even when their power increases or decreases, continue to have sufficient reasons to comply. So we have an, flex, an equilibrium, but an equilibrium that is flexible, that changes over time, and that opens the possibility for spirals. By a spiral, I mean this phenomenon. A country becomes a little stronger and it demands more favorable terms. Because it has more favorable terms, it becomes even stronger and then can go back and say, oh, now that I'm even stronger, I want even more favorable terms. And so here you have a country that rises because the rules are changed in its favor it got stronger, the rules get changed in its favor again, it gets even stronger and so forth. And the same can happen in reverse. A country may weaken, the rules then get changed in its disfavor, it weakens again, it, the rules get changed again in its disfavor. And so you can be in a descending spiral and ultimately, and this is very familiar in international relations, ultimately you disappear, you are no longer there. So a modus vivendi is an institutional order that provides a certain security to everyone. There are rules and the players abide by the rules, but a modus vivendi does not provide long-term safety, long-term, even the worst fate is possible for the participants, for states, for example. So it is possible for even the United States, currently the strongest power, gradually to be completely disappeared from the system, to completely fade away through such a downward spiral. And again, this has happened. States that were dominant at some point hundreds of years ago are no longer in this world at all. So a modus vivendi is then under a surface of civility, an all out struggle for power that ultimately is unlimited. There is no limit to what can happen to you. And that's the system we are in now and that is a system that is really quite dangerous. It's dangerous because you can be disappeared through a downward spiral. And it is dangerous because those who are feeling that they are under threat and that they are losing power may say, I will quit the modus vivendi now when I'm still reasonably strong and I will fight rather than allow myself to be gradually disappeared. So we were very lucky in the 1980s and 90s when the Soviet Union greatly lost power and did so without deciding to fight its declining power. Uh, we should not regard that as a huge triumph, how clever we were and so on. What we did is we ran a stop sign at high speed and we were lucky. So a modus vivendi is really a dangerous situation to be in. And I see little probability that we will as humankind survive for centuries on end if we remain in a prudent, prudentially based modus vivendi sort of system. So 
one other disadvantage of a modus vivendi, one other very painful thing about it is something that I mentioned briefly before. That is that we have to live disconnected from our own values. We deeply believe in certain things. We believe, let's say, in human rights. We believe in uh, not using economic power to dominate the poor. But we cannot live up to our own values because we find ourselves in a competition with other major powers. And in this competition, we must maximize our own power. So, for example, uh, you hear the Americans say and uh, the Chinese say, you know, we love Africa. We want to help Africa. We want to be sweet and kind to Africa and help the Africans get on their feet to be successful, to develop. But really, we cannot sacrifice anything important for the development of Africa because we are in this struggle with our rivals, with the Chinese, with the Americans, with the Russians, whatever. And so therefore we need to be self-interested. We need to exploit all the opportunities we have, including the natural resources of Africa in order to be as strong as possible and to prevail in the struggle with our rivals. If we ever do prevail, then of course we can be sweet and kind and live up to our values. But for the time being, we must fight ruthlessly in international affairs. We must leave our morality at home as we compete with our adversaries. Now, let me analyze that one step further, a little bit more in depth, a more fine grained to see again how dangerous and complex a modus vivendi is. You probably know that st students of international relations analyze power in these three categories. They say that power of states is based on military strength, economic strength, and soft power, which is everything else, sort of the moral standing in the world, also your culture, uh, Bollywood, for example, or Tagore, or uh, the long cultural tradition of your country. This is soft power that may also help you influence the behavior of others. Now, these three types of power, in the end, they flow together into power with a capital P. And that raises the question of what is more important? Which of the, you know, what is the exchange rate among these three sources of power? The answer is there is no fixed exchange rate. It all depends on the context. If you are in the middle of World War II, then soft power matters very little. It doesn't matter whether your film industry produces wonderful movies. What matters is military power. What matters is tanks and aircraft. Uh, and of course, to some extent, economic power, meaning the capacity to produce tanks and aircraft. If you are in a time of nice peace, like the 1990s maybe, then military power is not so important and soft power can mean a lot. So the exchange rate depends on the context. And that means that different countries have different interests with regard to the context. If you are the United States, or if you are Israel, or North Korea, or Pakistan, then you are militarily very strong relative to how strong you are economically and in soft power. And then you want the world to be one in which military power matters a lot. You don't want war, but you want a world of tension, hostility, crisis, in which your big army is meaningful and matters. If you are a country like Germany, for example, then 
you want economic power to matter and military power not so much because you have a small army and you are just not very strong militarily. So in a modus vivendi, the different countries have different interests with regard to the environment. Some of them want hostility and crisis. Others are more interested in a stable, peaceful international environment and climate. The same is true even <clears throat> within countries. So if you are the president of the United States, the head of the executive, when are you strongest relative to the other branches of government, relative to the Congress and the Senate? Well, you are strongest when there is a time of crisis, when you are the commander in chief commanding the armed forces. So if there's a crisis, if Iran is doing something in the Gulf or if uh, the Chinese are conducting a military exercise, then you are more powerful as president because you have to deal with the crisis, you have to move fleets around the globe, and that strengthens your position relative to the other branches of government, relative also to the individual states. So even within a country, there are competing interests with regard to the international environment. And that leads to an asymmetry, namely an asymmetry or brings up an asymmetry, namely that a context of tension, hostility and crisis is easier to create than to avert. So if the president of the United States is in some power struggle with the legislature and if he thinks that it would help him to have an international crisis he can produce one he can make one and similarly if israel is thinking that its power in the world would be increased by having a bit of crisis around it can create a crisis so crises are easier to create than to avoid and that means that those countries and those domestic players within countries who would benefit from greater tension, greater crisis and hostility, typically win and achieve that. And this again shows that a modus vivendi is dangerous. In a modus vivendi, there are definitely always going to be some parties that want the modus vivendi to be in crisis, to be uh, in an atmosphere of hostility and tension, because that increases their importance, the importance of military power in terms of which they are especially strong. The President of the United States, North Korea, the United States, and so on. So there are always going to be players who want to keep the modus vivendi on the edge. Just to be very careful, they don't necessarily want war. This is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they want to be on the edge of war. They want to be close to war. They want to be in tension, in hostility, in crisis. And that means a modus vivendi is unlikely ever to be genuinely peaceful because there are always going to be interested parties that want to keep it on the edge of conflict. So let's look at a more complicated diagram that has two dimensions. So we are now leaving out the independent uh, rivalry of states option and just look in, at institutional orders. These institutional orders for the world can be based prudentially or morally and we can have a highly centralized system or a more federalist system. Uh, the two familiar options are the global leviathan that uh, Kant and Hobbes proposed and that uh, we would now associate with the world government. 
uh, we could also have a world government that is morally based. That would, of course, be the hope in the long run, a kind of global democracy that would be just like India, except global. And we could have a value based federation, a kind of decentralized system, a federalized system, but one that relies on morality as its dominant mode rather than on prudence. And that is the option that I think we should aim for and can realistically achieve in this century, uh, whereas a world government is very difficult to achieve and probably impossible. And in any case, if it is achievable, it is achievable only by passing through a value-based federation of the sort that I now want to have a look at. So is genuine peace through such a morally based federation, is that reachable, is that possible? I think we have to say it is reachable because we have something very much like it in many of the most advanced states, in particular the federally organized states, where violence and the threat of violence are no longer significant sources of political influence, where economic inequality is moderate and not a major source of political dominance, where communities enjoy freedom to organize themselves according to their own values, consistent with and protected by the shared values of the national order and citizenry, and where government and state agencies, this is a very important point, are led and staffed by officials who are loyal to the nation and its values, rather than to the values of their family, province, or religious community. This is an overlooked but very important feature of modern federalist states. So let me test and see whether you have this in India. So think of a, a election in India, a national election, where a person becomes prime minister. Do Indians in that case worry that the new prime minister will favor his or her home province over all the pro other uh, provinces? Not so much. I think it is understood in India, it is widely expected and expected in a normative sense that the Prime Minister of India must govern in the interests of the whole country. He or she must be the Prime Minister of all Indians and treat them all without favor equally, take the interests of all Indians equally seriously. So you switch hats. You may have been the leader of your province, and then you were fiercely fighting for the interests of your province, of your state. But once you become prime minister of India, you take off the hat of being uh, from Bangalore or from being from uh, Kerala or whatever it may be, Uttar Pradesh. You wear the hat of the all Indian prime minister. Everybody in India understands that, even the people in your home province understand that. And so you are in that sense, even handed. Now, this is something that we need also at the international level. So the international peace would have the same four elements. States uh, would, need a clear, attractive vision for a post modus vivendi world. And they should shape their foreign policies and international design initiatives to accord with that vision. So in that future world, violence and threats would no longer be significant sources of influence. Economic inequality would be moderate and no source of political domination. Countries would enjoy freedom to organize themselves according to their own values, 
consistent with and protected by globally shared values and their embodiment in the global order. And new and old global institutions like the United Nations, the WTO, the World Bank, and so on, they would be led and staffed by officials who are loyal to humanity at large and loyal to its shared values and principles rather than to their home state. This is something that we currently don't have. So we have currently states fighting very vigorously over who gets to appoint, whose person gets to be the head of the World Bank, whose person gets to be the head of the WTO and so on. So the World Bank is always headed by a US person and the US is very eager to make that the case and is willing to concede the IMF to the Europeans because everybody understands that people in such an office continue to be loyal to their home country. So with international peace of the sort I envisage, that would disappear and there would be international officials who are loyal to humanity at large, much like the Indian prime minister is and is expected to be loyal to India at large and not to his or her home province. Now, such a genuine international peace can only be built step by step. That involves replacing pieces of our international institutional architecture that reflect the shifting bargaining power of states with substitutes that manifestly express our shared commitment to basic justice and the common good. So instead of fighting over particular pieces of the institutional architecture of the world, which with each state trying to shape that piece to be as much in its own interest as possible, we need to sit down and shape these pieces with an eye to optimally meeting the needs and interests of all human beings on the planet. These substitutions, any one of these substitutions, would ideally be beneficial to all and would not change the relative standing of the most powerful states so that nobody, China, US, India, Europe, that nobody would think this is just a trick. You know, they're trying to weaken me by proposing this substitution. It should affect the dominant states equally and it should mainly improve the condition of the poor and vulnerable populations in the developing world. So one example that I've worked on a lot and the vice chancellor mentioned that is the replacement of monopoly patents with impact rewards. This would be a huge benefit, an enormous benefit to humanity at large and the poorer parts of humanity in particular. Uh, big companies that are the patent holders today would still benefit, they would still be rewarded, but they would be rewarded for their innovation in a way that does not exclude poor people. Today, innovations are very expensive because they are marked up by monopolists. So medicines cost much more than their cost of production. And similarly for green innovations, for agricultural innovations, for many other innovations as well. If we could make that switch, we would establish one plank of an international order that is morally based and could give us a model for the transition to a world in which maximization of power is no longer the be all and end all of government policy. Such a process would build trust in the possibly divergent values of others. It would initiate and maintain a value-focused international public discourse. 
And most importantly, it would establish internal cultural constraints against a relapse into a pure modus vivendi where states act prudentially. How would it do so? It would do so by basically saying to the world, my people are my bond. My people at home, my own population would not let me go back on my commitment to this and that particular morally based piece of institutional architecture. My people at home would vote me out of office, would kick me out if I were to go back and use uh, a particular piece of institutional architecture merely as a trick to maximize the power of my own country. So that's it. That is a sketch of the kind of progress that we need to make. The key point that I'm making to summarize it in one sentence is that we have to think of progress not simply in the dimension of going from a world of many states in the direction of a world state, so shifting governmental authority up from the level of the nation state to a level of a central government, strengthening the United Nations and so on. But there is a second, even much more important dimension of progress, and that is going from a purely prudential system where each state feels compelled to maximize its own power to a system where at least some of our international institutions are based on values rather than an equilibrium of prudential interests of states. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. But is there a discussion moderator. Nimaida. How can you hear us? I have concluded. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yes, Thomas, we have got some questions for you. So shall I ask my colleague to state those questions? Uh, it's very hard to understand hard what you're saying. Sorry. Um, sorry. No, we have got some questions for you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we'll ask my colleague to. Uh, it's important question. to be speaking close to the microphone so that I can really understand the question. It's difficult if you talk into the room. Is this clear now? Yes, I can. I can hear. Okay. okay. Sir, sir, am I audible? Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, we have a few questions. Uh, let me bring one by one. First one is, what is new on Asimogli and Robinson view that states have a narrow corridor to achieve liberty? 
what they call the hello yeah uh, uh, i don't have a, a developed view on that i'm sorry okay okay hello i i don't know this concept of a shackled leviathan oh. okay second sir so another question we know that yeah. the political scenario the state depends on economic situation how a modus living works in different types of society agrarian society industrial society etc so can you hear yeah, me so Yes, I can hear you. So uh, a modus vivendi uh, uh, or the modus vivendi that I discussed is a modus vivendi not within states, but a modus vivendi among states. So this would be a modus vivendi that includes the different types of society in it. So there would be agrarian societies, industrial societies, and so on, all being part of the same modus vivendi. Uh, and this is what we now have that uh, of course a modus vivendi uh, is a state in which the different societies are trying to maximize their power relative to the others and their industrial societies may have an advantage over agrarian societies uh, because they can outperform them economically but basically uh, the modus vivendi is a concept that uh, is that sort of spans the distinction between different types of society. All the different types of society are part of the same international system in which the rules are shaped through negotiations among them that are based on their respective bargaining power. Thank you, sir. Uh, then the next part of the question is how equilibrium attains between different types of mines, agrarian mine, industrial mine, and other types. How we deal with the refugees issues in this mode? The refugees mode. Yeah. Um, so let me see whether I understand that. Uh, the again, you know the. Modus vivendi, the fundamental principle of a modus vivendi is that uh, the participants all speak the same language in the sense that they are focused on power. So each one of them is uh, maybe interested in increasing their power and resources, but certainly they are very determined not to allow their power and resources to be diminished by others. So that's why they pay attention to power. So I don't know what's meant by an agrarian mind or an industrial mind, but if you take a society that is an agrarian society that is very happy with what it has and is not expansionary and doesn't really want to change its lifestyle, even such a society within a modus vivendi system must be aware that other societies are fighting against each other, competing against each other, and that it itself is a valuable resource in this fight. So for example, take the colonial period. Uh, the European countries were competing against each other, having frequent wars, and they regarded the rest of the world as chips, as things to be taken possession of in order to better protect themselves in their rivalry with one another. So the Germans were saying, look, if we let the British gobble up all the colonies around the world, then the British will become much stronger than we are and they will dominate Europe and dominate us. We are not going to allow that to happen. We are going to grab our own colonies and similarly for the French and so on. So uh, even if some societies have an agrarian mindset or a peaceful mindset or a non-expansionary mindset, uh, the others will not allow them such peace. The others will regard them as resources 
to be acquired in order to prevail and protect oneself in the competition against others. Okay, sir. Then so another see, question is... Yeah, I see Bertrand Russell, the Russell question, right? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Russell uh, was indeed, he was very strongly uh, in favor of, or he thought that there were strong arguments in favor of world right. government. And he was okay. even in favor of uh, continuing the Second World War and defeating the Soviet Union in order to establish a monopoly of nuclear weapons uh, at the end of World War II or at least that's the, the dominant interpretation. And again, I think that uh, he was maybe skeptical or maybe he overlooked the dimension of progress that I'm sketching here. Uh, if a world state of the sort that Bertrand Russell imagined was ever possible, I think it was immediately after Second World War where the United States did have enough military force to uh, essentially force a monopoly of nuclear weapons upon the rest mm -hmm. of the world. Basically, the US could have said in 1946, we will not allow any other country to have a military that will rival ours. Nobody else is allowed to have nuclear weapons. Everybody else is allowed to have just a small army for domestic purposes and regional purposes. And we will be the dominant army in the world. Uh, that might have been possible then. It's completely impossible now, not achievable now. And even then, it might well have been a bad idea. But that's a long discussion that maybe would take us too far afield now. Now, global peace, a utopian phenomenon. Um, yes, I think it, it is utopian in the sense that uh, it is a long way off from where we are. And it's difficult to imagine existing governments to work in the direction in which I'm indicating they should work. However, uh, if you want to be a realist, then you also have to be a realist about the future that we are now moving towards. If you are a realist, you have to say, it is not very likely that humanity can survive in the current modus vivendi order for centuries on end, right? Is there a major danger for the next 20 years? Maybe not, maybe not. A few percent, 3%, 4% danger of a major war among states. But if you think 500 years ahead, the danger becomes very, very large. Because in a modus vivendi system, everybody is extremely concerned to protect themselves, not to be overtaken by new dangerous technologies, not to fall behind in the competition with others. And that, as I showed in the analysis of the modus vivendi system, poses a, a great source of instability in such a modus vivendi system, that a state that fears that it will shrink and be marginalized may say, it's better for me to strike now while I still can than to allow myself to be gradually weakened and weakened over centuries or decades to the point where I become dominated by other new arrivals who are stronger than myself. So I hope that there will be far-sighted statesmen who see the great danger of the track that we are on and will help us get onto a track where we rebuild our international architecture in a way that it has more and more moralized elements that are immune to the shifting distribution of bargaining power and are kept in place by the moral commitment of the population of many strong states. Yeah, the, about the, the next question about uh, the national peace. 
yeah, so uh, deeply heterogeneous communities, I think that uh, the heterogeneity hopefully is not so deep that it makes it impossible to agree on certain institutional elements that govern the interaction among those communities. So this is something that we face, a problem that we face both domestically and also internationally. Of course, we have different values and we have to come to terms with that. We have to be uh, prepared to respect the values of other cultures and to respect their way of life and also to give them security, to not merely tolerate them and say for the time being that you have a lot of power, I will tolerate you. But if your power ever declines and you ever become less powerful, then I will no longer allow you to exist, right? That is exactly what we must not do. We must not merely tolerate, we must respect and we must build our international order on such respect and say this international order is pluralistic in the sense that it allows different modes of national organization to thrive and thereby also different cultural communities to thrive. And this is something that domestically we have already achieved to some extent. If you look at India, India has a plurality of cultures that coexist with each other under an institutional framework that is not simply based on power where a community can maintain its independence so long as it's strong enough, but that is based on the common commitment of the Indian population to say, we want to be a pluralistic society. We want to respect one another. We are committed to protecting even those with whose communal values we disagree. So that's the kind of model that I want to see internationalized. Yeah, so the, there is a question from Asha Mukherjee about the reachability of genuine peace. And the, yeah, the difficulty is indeed uh, to make the transition from a system in which prudence is the overwhelmingly dominant consideration in international relations, where foreign policy of states is driven by the imperative that we must maintain and enhance our power as much as possible. And so the question is, how can we get from such a world? How can we gradually get to a world in which we sideline the prudential concerns and the fear that states feel of losing power, of being sidelined, being marginalized, uh, how can we gradually make that transition? And what I was suggesting is that we one by one rebuild our institutional architecture at the supranational level in such a way that we replace prudentially based elements with morally based elements. So my example was replacing the system that rewards innovators on the basis of monopoly markups with a system that rewards them on the basis of impact. This would be a hugely important innovation for the large majority of humankind, for poor people. And it would be something that would be disadvantageous to the most advanced states, namely the states in whom the corporations that are the big innovators are located. So states like the United States, Japan, and Europe, they have, because they are capital rich, they are the big innovators today. They are responsible for most of the patentable innovations in technology, in science, in pharmacology, and so on. 
So it would be a sacrifice for them. It would make them economically a little worse off. But my hope is that it would affect them relatively equally and so would not shift the bargaining equilibrium among them. So none of them would feel threatened by it because their adversaries, their closest rivals, would also similarly be disadvantaged by that change. And they all could say that the new system with impact rewards better serves our values. It much better serves our commitment to human rights, our commitment to the sustainable development goals, to leave nobody behind, and so on. And so it would be the kind of reform that would gradually move us in a moral direction. So we are a little bit like the famous, you know, from the, I don't know whether you know, the legend of Theseus, a Greek hero. Uh, his, he needed to rebuild the boat on which he was traveling while he was at sea. And so you have to build plank by plank uh, while you are at sea. And the similar, we have to build plank by plank our international order to replace prudential elements that depend on the diverse competing interests of states with elements that are based on shared commitments to values. No matter how diverse our values may be, we all agree that hunger is a terrible thing, that disease is a very terrible thing, and that hunger and disease should be eradicated all over the world. So in Africa, in India, in uh, every part of the world where uh, tropical diseases still are a problem, we should try to eradicate these diseases and help people lead worthwhile lives. And that common commitment can inform the transition uh, to a system of impact funds over uh, innovations rewards based on monopolies and can gradually build trust in one another. We are collaborating with one another in establishing morally based bits and pieces of a coming international order. Good. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir, one question from question One more question. Uh, is national peace possible when the executive is executing upon not only different states but with the heterogeneous communities of people where the existence of a sense of agreement is not reachable easily? Yes. This is a question on the national level is whether national peace, ah, here it is, I see it, I see it, wonderful. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you answer your own question as it were, right? The, the thing is, uh, what we need to achieve, we need to uh, achieve a sense of agreement. I agree that this can be very hard to reach. And it can be especially hard to reach out of a modest vivendi, right? I am now in a modest vivendi and I, and I know the other communities only as rivals. I know them only as rivals. They are competing with me. They are trying to become more powerful than I am and in their interactions with me and one another, they act badly. They act badly because they are in the business of power maximization. And so, you know, if you think about how the US thinks about China, for example, the US says these Chinese people, they're terrible. They are maximizing power. They go everywhere. They uh, swing their big stick. They use their military. They use their economic strength to, to exploit weaker countries like Sri Lanka, for example, and so on. Terrible. 
And they're right. The Chinese are behaving terribly in international relations. But that's how the Chinese behave in the context of a modus vivendi system where the maximization of power is the first imperative. And of course, if you look at the United States, you say the same thing. You say they behave terribly. They throw their power around. They try to pressure smaller countries. They uh, send their armies all over the world. They uh, send drones to assassinate people and so on. They behave terribly. They torture people in black sites. So uh, you are completely right. It's very difficult to come to an agreement and to the first thing we need to understand is this is not something about the nature of the Chinese and the nature of the Americans. This is something about how they behave in a modus vivendi system where they feel threatened and feel that they have to give priority to the imperative of survival and protecting their power, maximizing their own power. Once you understand that, then you can say, look, uh, we understand that you could be much nicer if you were more relaxed, if you weren't so afraid, if you were not so focused on this game of power competition. And to bring out the nice side in you, let us think about how we can together build a few moral institutional elements in our international order that would serve the values that you have and I have and would also build trust between us. Once you have done that, once you have built something moral together, then it's much harder to see the other side as pure evil. You see that if they are more relaxed, if they are more at ease, then they can potentially be nice partners that respect us and are committed to protecting our right to exist like we would be committed to protecting their right to exist and to thrive. So uh, commenting on, uh, on the relevance of perpetual peace, I brought in perpetual peace mainly to show you that Kant's thinking was too narrow. So Kant was himself, he said that in politics, really we cannot overcome the system of prudence. Politics is based on power and it will always be based on power. It will always be a competition of power. And so for Kant, the only solution really was centralization of power Politics can work nationally and internationally only through an overwhelming amount of power concentrated at one point. So he endorses a world republic. He wants that power to be democratically exercised. Of course, he wants a republic, but he says we need one centralized uh, power center in order to make that work. So the biggest mistake of Kant in this area, I think, was his commitment to the dogma of absolute sovereignty, that he could not uh, foresee that a, a system of differentiated power, like we have it today in India and in Switzerland and in Germany and in the United States, that such a federalist system with checks and balances is really possible. It was from his historical vantage point, he, was, he didn't have that experience and he was too much convinced by an argument that works very well in theory, but is just proving too much in practice. Now, with regard to Rawls, uh, Rawls is, uh, again, you know, he is, committed to the second model in perpetual peace, uh, a model where we have a confederation of states. And he really is 
not willing to go in the direction of a world republic. So he rejects the picture that Kant would have favored. He wants a system of diverse states, but in that system, he is much less ambitious than I am. So the, when you look at the law of peoples that he wrote, he basically is endorsing a modus vivendi system with a few items that are morally based. So for example, a duty of assistance is based on uh, the moral agreement that states will support one another, at least to the point where they can all maintain either a liberal or decent regime. But in the end, in Rawls's telling of the story, uh, the basic features of a, a modus vivendi system would remain in place. And he would just hope that there would be enough of a balance of power among states to maintain that system in a stable equilibrium. So I think that uh, Rawls does not really solve the problem of the long-term instability of a modus vivendi and the grave danger that over a long period of time, we will find ourselves in uh, a major war, World War III, basically. Any other thoughts? Shona Jatsana Kitchu, we plug that started developing uh, around I hear nothing, sorry. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Hi, yes, I now I can, but not yeah. before. Okay, okay. okay. Mm. The United Nations. It's gone. Gone. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry, it comes in and out. It, it's completely inaudible at times, and then it comes back. Can you type it into the chat function? It's no, no sound. Is my voice audible to you? Yes, now I hear you. Okay, Thomas, I think you know, my colleague will be So before my colleague, you know, put his question in the chat box. I would like to raise three one-liner questions to you. One-liner question. The first one, it seems that you have taken an, a position of being an idealist. Because modus vivendi, the replace you're talking about, doesn't seem to be real, given what is happening around now. That's one. Second thing, are you heading towards taking the Marxist position of a communist state? When the state withers away, when administration of things to be administration of main to be replaced by administration of things, when from each according to his ability to act, each according to his needs will be implemented. So are you heading towards that kind of position while you are talking about post modus vivendi state? That's the second question. The third is you now in view of the existence of the, the institutions, global institutions like UN, like WTO, like IMF, do you think is it possible to shift to a kind of state which you are contemplating? If so, how do you propose to bring that 
happen? How do how you propose to make that happen? Right? You got my questions? Yes, excellent. Very good. And they really are, they go to the heart of the lecture. So thank you very much for these questions. So the first question about the idealism, uh, yes, uh, I'm perfectly happy to uh, call myself an idealist and I'm perfectly happy to concede that given the game that is currently played among states, uh, this is a, it's a game changer. It would completely revolutionize the way uh, states play their game of uh, seeking power. And, but the, the one point I want to emphasize is that if we continue playing the game that we are now playing, the game of realism, we have to be realistic and understand that states are power seekers and we have to protect ourselves. Our first responsibility as a government is to protecting the power and interests of our own people, of our own country. So we have to play the game exactly like the others are playing the game in order to protect our most important responsibilities, which is our own country, our own people and their interests. If we continue to play that game, then we must realistically understand that this game will in the end kill us all. This game in the end is not survivable for humanity. It is, you know, we are doing the rational thing at each moment, but if we all continue to uh, serve the realism of the present, uh, the imperative of power maximization and self-protection, then in the end, we will all lose. So that was the fundamental insight of my analysis of the modus vivendi system. A modus vivendi system has a significant continuous danger of collapse, which over a long period of time accumulates into something close to a certainty. So that's why I want to say that in one sense, I'm also a realist. I'm a realist who recognizes that the present system is not in the long term sustainable and that we need that revolutionary change in the way the game is played in order even to survive. Now, the second thing about uh, Marxism, so no, I am not connected uh, to that except in the following way. Uh, I am very friendly towards Marxist ideas in the sense that if states somewhere in the world want to try them out and want to live in a Marxist way uh, where everybody is working according to their abilities and uh, taking from the commons in accordance to their needs, I would say absolutely yes, that's a wonderful idea, do it. So my reaction to Cuba would have been to say, how lovely, that's the Cubans want to try something new let them try it. I am very curious. I want to see how it works. Let the whole world look at it and learn from it. And let's support these guys. Let's, let's trade with them. Let's support them. Let's see what they can do. And so I'm envisaging a world in which Marxist experiments and other experiments of living are possible and are protected by the common force of us all where we don't say, oh my God, you know, this country is going communist. And that means that now there is a, uh, a, a new chess figure is on the chess board that might be threatening me in some way, or in the long run, my geopolitical position is undermined if a country friendly to the Soviet Union emerges near my borders or something. All of that is part of a modus vivendi framework of power maximization, which is exactly what we need to get away from. So uh, again, I'm not committed to any particular way of organizing society, but rather to a deep respect among societies where societies say, you know, we organize ourselves this way 
but who knows, maybe this is not the best way. And for now we believe in it, but we would love to see what you are doing, what you are trying and how you want to organize yourself. Of course, not without limit. If another country is organizing itself for aggressive war, uh, of course we will uh, try to operate against that. And also if a country is extremely repressive, for example, murders some of its citizens or suppresses women, that would be a reason not to be uh, respectful of that other culture. But within a wide range of options, I think we should be uh, supportive and we should be supportive of different kinds of capitalist regimes, communist regimes, and so on. Now the transition of existing organizations and the possible addition of new ones at the uh, supranational level, uh, this would go in several dimensions. So let's start with the transition of uh, existing organizations. Uh, these existing organizations, uh, there's a big gap typically between their ideology, what they claim to be doing, and what they're actually doing. That's a starting point for reform. So take the World Bank, for example, right? If you go to the headquarter of the World Bank, you have the big slogan there for a world without poverty. So the World Bank, you know, the, the one thing that they believe in, the big thing that they are working for is a world without poverty. Now, before you get out your handkerchiefs and start crying because you are so moved by the great selfless and moral commitment of the World Bank, let me tell you that this is not what the World Bank is actually doing. The World Bank is an instrument of the major uh, capitalist powers in the world, and it's fighting very vigorously for the interests of, in particular, the United States, which, as I've mentioned, has appointed the director of the World Bank as far as anybody can remember, all the way back to the Bretton Woods Agreement. So uh, what we can do is gradually transform the World Bank into the kind of bank that it claims to be, namely a bank that really cares about development, really cares about protecting the economic interests of poor people and poor populations. And how to do that? Well, a very important step is to change the expectation on the personnel, the people at the World Bank have to shed the understanding that they are there to represent the interests of their home country. I'm the French guy at the World Bank. I'm the American guy at the World Bank. And they have to understand themselves as civil servants for the world at large. You have a little bit of that when you look at the oath of office of the Secretary General of the United Nations you get a little glimpse of what that could be like. I want to see such an oath of office for civil servants in the UN system, in the World Bank, in the IMF more generally. I want these officials to understand themselves as being responsible to the mission, to the official mission of their organization and to shed any allegiance to their home country exactly as I said, uh, the Prime Minister of India is committed to the good of all Indians and sheds any loyalty or allegiance to his or her home province. So that would be another step, another important step in the moralization of these institutions. And of course, they would also have to be reforms. There would have to be a few new institutions that we do not have now and modifications in the mission of old institutions that we now have in order to make them more clearly devoted to the interests and needs of all human beings worldwide, rather than only to the needs and interests of a few. So the OECD is an example. The OECD is a club of rich countries that decides many important things for the world at large. For example, it spearheads the fight against corruption in the world. 
And the poor countries are not even in the OECD. They have observer status or some place a minor role or something. Obviously, that would need to be reformed as well. But you know, uh, Tom, I, I, I am persuaded by the argument which you put forward because it's done in a very immaculate manner. But you know, I am just drawing attention to India. You know, Gandhi, Gandhi brought independence by resorting to non-violence, and India is perhaps now one of the most violent countries in the world. And secondly, even after Gandhi became the Mahatma, India has had a war with Pakistan. You know, there are five wars so far. So I think, you know, I mean, probably what you are saying will come true in, in thousands and thousands of years from now on. But as of now, as of today, I don't know, I, I still continue to believe that we will favor the nationalist orientation more than the global orientation that you seem to favor so, you know, what is called practically. Yes, yes, I see where you're coming from and I still, I want to say this, if you love your country, what you call the national orientation, if you love your country, you should follow my thinking. You don't want your country to live in a permanent state of war with Pakistan, right? You want your country to live in peace with Pakistan. You want the danger of a major nuclear war with Pakistan to be as small as possible. Not necessarily because you love Pakistan, but because you love India, that's why. And so the question that I'm raising is, how can we really protect India from a major war with Pakistan? One way to protect it is we build weapons and weapons and weapons and we scare the shit out of the Indians. They will not dare to attack us because we are just so much stronger than they are. And fine, if you want to go that route, go that route. But you will never be safe. You will never be truly safe. You will never be able to ensure that the Pakistanis will not come up with some new technology or some new trick or something. And of course, the Pakistanis will work on that incessantly because they are as scared of you as you are scared of them. They will try to innovate in weapons. They will try to scheme about how they can overcome your defenses and can uh, reach military parity with India or maybe even superiority. So the thing that the point that I'm making is that even if you are oriented in a nationalist way, even if your main love is to your own country, you should think about how your country would do better in a global environment that is based on moral respect for one another than in a global environment that is kept safe only by the fear that the various countries have of one another and their willingness to engage in a kind of power-based bargaining that leads to a modus vivendi of rules that for the time being maintain a fragile peace, but in the long run are endangering the safety of everybody. <laughs> Well, Thomas, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, Thomas, I think it's almost two hours, so I don't want to burden with many questions. I think there is one question which my colleague has asked. If you can read that and respond, I think that will be done. Okay. Yeah, um, 
I'm, I'm not understanding the question well, but I will try my best. So uh, the international protest culture based on new techno capabilities and human rights ideal adopted by the UN is posing problems to states. Does this demand, uh, demand an international political response? So uh, the, uh, as regards the ideal of human rights, that's of course an ideal that I share and that I want to be implemented more widely in the international institutional arrangements. So here, insofar as there is an international protest culture appealing to human rights, I am sympathetic to that protest culture. And I think that states, uh, that human rights should figure much more prominently in foreign policy of states and also, and in particular, in the institutional design decisions that states make. So we should organize, in particular, the world economy in a way that is much more respectful of human rights than it currently is, where we still have large uh, percentages of the human population uh, unable to meet their most basic human needs, uh, sort of social and economic needs, and where human rights remain widely unfulfilled. Uh, now, the new techno capabilities, uh, that's a, uh, a a different question. I think you bring them in here to say that uh, with modern technological means like Facebook and social media and so on, this protest culture can thrive and can maybe uh, exert more power and articulate its views more widely. That is true and that uh, from my point of view that is a good thing, but uh, the new techno capabilities on the whole uh, are one of the great, great dangers that we face in the future. I didn't mention that danger. I also didn't say much about climate change, but uh, these techno capabilities, uh, in particular, the possibility of big data collection and the use of these big data to manipulate individuals and groups, uh, I see that as a very major threat in the future. So this data, these techno capabilities are in the process now of being weaponized. So states are accumulating these uh, capabilities. You see very small echoes of it already. You see the Russians trying to influence the US elections in 2016. Uh, so you use big data. Cambridge Analytica was the company that was doing that. You collect these data and you try to build a profile of even individual citizens, a profile that allows you to manipulate these citizens' political opinions, these citizens' purchasing decisions, and so on. So there is a real danger that with the assistance of artificial intelligence, we will come to a world in which each of us is constantly observed and manipulated where when I log into my computer, I get stimuli that are very carefully designed to make me think in certain ways, to make me act in certain ways, to buy certain things, to vote in certain ways, to visit certain websites and get further manipulated and so on. And again, in the modus vivendi system, no government will feel that it can pass up these opportunities, right? The Chinese are doing this, they're working on it, the Russians are working on it. If I don't work on this also, I will fall behind in this technology race and I will lose in the competition for power against my rivals. And again, I see that as a very grave danger that we are losing control of what happens in the world because each of us, each of the major governments feels compelled. They say, I have no choice. I have to get into this technology. I have to do this because I have to remain competitive with my closest rivals. And again, that is extremely dangerous 
uh, not perhaps in the sense of courting the danger of war, but courting the danger of a world in which we are completely manipulated by sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithms that simply treat us as stimulus response systems that can be made to do whatever these algorithms are programmed to try to make us do. Not a world I want to live in, for sure. So I think, Thomas, uh, we are done. Uh, thanks for having spent almost two hours with us. And with your thought-provoking speech, uh, we we'll tend to become more idealist than realist. And hopefully, whatever you are hoping to achieve in course of time, we'll all be partners in your mission. It'd be good. Um, so, but uh, as I said at the outset, uh, you, you are welcome to visit us at your convenience. So next time when you come to Kerala or Delhi, I think please include Santini Ketan or Vishwabharati in your itinerary. And needless to say, you will be our guest. And then we'll have discussion, lengthy discussion with you on some of the ideas which you have just floated. And uh, many of my colleagues have listened to you. I'm sure they will start thinking in that direction. And the place uh, where we are located now, as I said at the beginning, was founded by a very you know, renowned thinker who was an optimist. He also wanted to bring people together, regardless of you know, class, caste, and ethnicity, because his main concern was to abolish hierarchy and to just bring people in one platform. So I think your ideas are post uh, given the state and the ideas which Tagore thought about in the early 1920s was and since we belong to that particular part of the country, we appreciate your optimism and we wish you all the best. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And we'll call you, I mean, we'll have the discussion session very soon. I'll let you know.